Okay, good morning and welcome everyone. The hottest time slot of the whole session, Thursday morning, 8.30 a.m. So uh, you guys are showing real dedication of being here. Um, also to say that this is being recorded, we'll be sharing it uh, online in the community and also on our YouTube channel. You can share this with others that are interested afterwards. I know there's been a lot of interest around the logistics use case throughout the entire week. I will be, so maybe first say who I am. I'm Breno Horst, LMIS Tech Lead at the HISP Center here at the University of Oslo. Uh, I've been working in this role for the past three years together with George McGuire, more recently Per Kronslev as the LMIS team, uh, guiding and nurturing this use case within the, this broad DHS2 world. Um, this will be a very short intro because I really want the focus to be on the five presenters, there's quite a few. And they will each give a short snapshot into different use cases, different uh, countries and different things that can be done and how the supply chain and logistics use case can be supported by using DHIS2. I'll just say a few words before that. Uh, first to say that on the uh, DHIS2 website at uh, docs.dhis2.org, on the YouTube channel um, and on our demo sites, we have examples and guidance on using DHIS2, configuring it for optimizing uh, supply chain management and stock management. Uh, we promote a clear last mile approach using it at facility level, digitizing facilities and integrating that into the digital landscape. All right. Also, not overusing DHIS2. We're not promoting it or uh, uh, selling it as a full-fledged ELMIS or much less an ERP. There are dedicated tools for that, and we've had a very defined use case. And I think that's one key uh, that we mentioned and we'd like to, to then share. Um, the more specific then cases being uh, stock management, both uh, monthly stock reporting and then a tra transactional based stock management tool, which we've developed, cold chain equipment management and biomedical equipment management through the tracker program. And then some different uh, features, for example, proof of delivery using an event program. And these are different and specific use cases that we promote and have shared uh, documentation and guidance on. And then lastly, analytics, bringing data together, sharing data and metadata across systems, because even if none of the logistics features are used within DHIS2, it's somewhat unavoidable. And I think all of you will, will agree, you come to a country, you're asking to implement your tool, um, DHIS2 is somewhere in the mix. And at the very least, it's gonna be sharing resources or uh, uh, metadata, uh, aligning users or organizational units, um, and also uh, triangulating data, sharing stock data, health service data, um, and then giving more information for users to make decisions, uh, not to mention reporting to donors, of course. So there's always the analytics and integration need, regardless of where and how you may be implementing. Um, now, before presenting quickly an overview of the presenters and, and the, um, the order, just to say that Again, for the past three years, we've been developing and nurturing this use case. And the two most common questions we get is which LMIS is the best and how much does it cost? I would like to challenge uh, everyone here, and I'm sure many of you share already this idea, um, but I just want to want to spell it out since those are the two most common questions that we first should define the needs. What are the needs of your use case? What are you looking to achieve? What are then your needs technically? And for that, you have what's called the target software standards uh, developed by the uh, interagency supply chain group, uh, which we can share links to, and there are links to that on our website, which gives you a full scale, a full breadth of logistics uh, capabilities that you may be interested in, but then choose the ones that are relevant, define the scope of your use case, and then look for which tool fits your need. All right, so that's one thing that I would really like to highlight because often the question is, which one is best and how much does it cost? Now, to quickly present, and I'll let the presenters actually introduce themselves. Uh, they'll be able to do that much better than me. But to say that first, we'll have the M Supply Foundation presenting their tool and their experiences and an integration approach with DHIS2. They'll be followed by the Ministry of Health Malawi, who I do not see in the room, so we may skip them and uh, maybe they'll come in during the session. But they have a cold chain equipment monitoring uh, um, uh, implementation where they're piloting in over 100 facilities registering cold chain equipment and reporting, including uh, analytics. And this is something that they're looking to scale up uh, later this year. Then we'll have the Medexis team, uh, uh, the iPlus Solutions team with the Medexis CLMIS uh, presenting their integration in Mali with DHIS2. 
Um, followed by then uh, the Ministry of Health Somalia will be presenting their existing use of DHIS2 and also their plans to expand uh, uh, new possibilities and, and looking forward on how they can leverage it even more for supply chain management. Lastly, we'll have the Softworks team presenting their soft LMIS that's been implemented with a lot of uh, good experiences um, and a lot of their problem solving and perspective on, on the use case on using DHIS2 for stock management as well. All right, so with that said, I would like to welcome the M Supply team and they can start. So, welcome. Uh, we will both be speaking. Over the right, the side. Not that one. Well, that's okay. I bet you. Nothing. I am not done. Is this working? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. You want to share from here? Yes, please. Wonderful. Do you want to introduce yourself? Because then I'll carry on. Please. Ah, yes. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for waking up for this. Um, I know it's a tough start. I'm Danya from the M Supply Foundation. And, and good morning. I'm Craig, uh, also from the M Supply Foundation. <laughs> Sounds like the start of a skip. <laughs> it's uh, right. Uh, We're going to tag team on this one. So, um, uh, who are we? Uh, we're a not-for-profit trust. Uh, we've been uh, we transitioned from being a company to a to a trust over the last few years, and uh, we've been working for twenty years now. And uh, we don't know where the time's gone. Um, currently, we're working in over forty countries, and uh, almost thirty of those were the national system for the country. So that's a decision that they've made. And uh, part of our transition to a trust is. Uh, uh, moving all our software over to being open source. Uh, that sounds so easy when you say it. It's, uh, it's a big job. It's, we're maybe just over halfway through the process and uh, uh, we are hoping to finish that in the next couple of years. At the moment, if you implement M Supply, you'll get 90-something uh, percent of your sites will be open source software. And lastly, uh, I looked it up. Uh, I changed it from over 10 years to almost 10 years. Uh, September 2014 was when we started to integrate with DHIS2. So we're almost at the 10 years point. So uh, that's where we're spread. Uh, a lot of our countries in the Pacific, but uh, increasingly in Africa and several in Southeast Asia as well. So we have... Uh, we have teams in Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria, and uh, we also have uh, quite a, most uh, development offices in Nepal and New Zealand, and a few a few staff spread around other parts of the world as well. Uh, there's four things that uh, we uh, focus on. Uh, the first one, <laughs> excuse me, is working out uh, with a country what you need. So uh, that's uh, maybe the most important thing. Uh, if you go down the wrong track, um, everything from there is going to be difficult. So uh, that's a, a process of really understanding uh, the infrastructure, uh, the people's capabilities, what the, what, the, what the country's ambitions are, what their problems are, all that kind of thing. Uh, moving on from there, let's say that they decide that they want us as part of their future. Uh, we work on deployments, and uh, uh, a lot of that is about uh, encouraging people to see that often people are quite scared when you start off implementing a new system, and you're saying, actually, this is a tool to help you do your job better. It's not to take your, take your job away. So um, uh, we get some lovely pictures from our part of the world, from the Pacific. Uh, we also uh, focus a lot on uh, building capacity locally. Um, uh, in our Maori culture, we, we have a, um, a proverb that uh, 
ask the question, what is the most important thing in the world? And the answer is, hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata, which means the people, the people, the people. It's saying that uh, actually, um, I think you, you could do a, a good software installation with any of the systems that you hear about today um, if the people side is handled well. And lastly, uh, in, this, in this way, we've taken a slight, somewhat different approach to DHIS2 over the years. Uh, we say that um, we'd uh, like to be there, uh, uh, we'd like you to pay us a regular support fee and we would like to provide you with the highest level of support we possibly can. And we take a sort of whatever it takes approach to keeping your systems working. Over to you. All right. So if you were using mSupply on the ground, this I know it's quite hard to envision what this could look like. So one first, just a little glimpse of our open mSupply software. We'll get to a demo soon, so I won't linger too long on that. But I just wanted to step through what some of the features and the reasons, the way we've developed mSupply to make it better for a lot of the countries we work in. And one of the big things we've focused on from the start is being offline first for last mile service points. And this, the way this works is that if you're in a remote facility and you're offline, you can still do your daily operational tasks. So you can dispense to patients or you can do your stock takes you can have your cold chain monitoring and that all works while offline. But at any point when the facility gets into reach of Wi-Fi or internet, they are then able to work regionally between M supplier sites. So this means you can send orders, receive orders. And if your supplier and customer facilities are both on M supply, you're receiving that straight in your system without having to look. But we know that there's always patchy internet in many places or a cable gets chewed through by rats, real stories, or um, just so there's so many things that happen on the ground. So we really do focus on making a good experience for offline first. And then in terms of what it could look like in a real world scenario, as we said, we try and say, do, do what works for the country first. So you might take some of this or all of this, but what you can have is full warehousing and master, and master data registry system at your national medical data medical store. And then open M supply at your intermediate warehouses where you can use LMIS functionality, um, including requisitions, cold chain monitoring, and more. And then at your service delivery points, you can have offline first pay, pay per patient dispensing. I'll get into how DHIS2 maps really well with that in just a little while. And throughout all of this, you can have your central warehouse interfacing with external suppliers through our health supply hub, where they've got a web portal to en engage with you. So the 10 year old integration that Craig was talking about is our built in integration for sending stock data to DHIS2. We know that you'd often want this regional overview. And so that's um, out of the box in M Supply. You can set it up. There's check boxes for what data you want to send to DHIS2. And then we have a way of mapping the, your medicines between M Supply and DHIS2. That's the out of the box with the check boxes. But, um, so we've been working a lot with Breno, George, and Per on the DHIS2 integration for service delivery points. So I just want to step through what that could look like. So we're back to what I showed you before, but here you have the option of using DHIS2 at the last mile delivery points. <clears throat> and we think again, that choosing what to implement at your service delivery points, whether it be M supply DHIS2 or another system really comes down to some key, key questions such as what is already being used at the service delivery point? Are they using a paper-based system? Are they using DHS to capture um, or something else entirely? And then next, are you interested in tracking batch and expiry at these points? Is that important to you or is that extra added complexity that isn't needed? The other one is how many users do we need for each service delivery point? 
And so if you're already using DHIS2 for HMIS at your service delivery point, it's going well. And you have one staff member at that service delivery point who already knows DHIS2 and doesn't need the complexity of learning a new system or needing to track batch and expiry dates, then we think it's a really great idea to use DHIS2 at your service delivery points. But I'll go into what that would actually look like. So we've worked a bit on this integration. Um, and so you would have M supply at the central warehouse and DHIS2 at your last mile facility. In that case, the person at the last mile facility would be doing their daily transactional operations on DHIS2. And then it would send a monthly stock report to M Supply once a month. From that, M Supply calculates the stock needed for each DHIS2 facility. It then sends that shipment info back to DHIS2 to the Capture app. This then means that the person at the facility can check that the information provided to them is correct once they receive the shipment. Um, and then if it's wrong, they'd have to call back to the central warehouse and check. Oh, I have doubled up, but we've got a nice um, summary of that. So, and then at that point, once they've confirmed that the what they've received is correct, the user confirms that sh the shipment has arrived and M Supply will update the stock on your DHIS2 capture logistics management module. So your stock would be updated. So that's a little bit of what it would look like. And for you to get a sense of what that looks like through, everything's a little bit mixed up. We'll just um, go through, but I'll give you a little sense of what Open M Supply looks like. So here is the login screen for Open M Supply. Currently I'm doing it on a web browser, but you can use an Android app or a desktop app to be offline. And all of that is the same user interface. So someone working on a tablet can move and expand into a desktop app if you want needed without that extra training. So I'll log on and in a nice alignment with DHIS2, we also have the nice custom themes so you can swap in your flag. We've got South Sudan here today and change the colors if needed. This is where you start off in Open M Supply. You come to a dashboard which has information for the role you're doing. So you can look at things like, do I have expiring stock? Do I have shipments that I'm waiting to ship? And it all links through to take you through. But I'm not good aware of time, so I'm just going to take you through a few quick features. Say I'm currently in a district store and I'm making an order to my central warehouse. I can go here and create what we call an internal order because my district store is also using M Supply. I'm choosing my supplier and then I can add from a list, selected list of medicines what I want to order. So I'm ordering all my essential medicines today. And the nice thing here is because you've done all of your transactional work on M Supply, this system knows what some of your target consumption or what your general consumption is. You can see your consumption history. And from that, M Supply, particularly if you've been using it for a while, is able to calculate what you might need for the next few while. So you can look here and see your target months of stock that you would have available versus your stock on hand. I am massively overstocked. So normally I wouldn't be ordering anything, but I can do that and order through. I can also just purely go through and use the suggested quantities from M Supply because as I said, I'm massively overstocked. It won't suggest much, but this will then go through directly to, let me just do that, confirm sent. And usually I wouldn't be able to do this, but since I'm on a demo ser server, I can go straight to my central warehouse and see that I've received an order from my district store. So that, but I ordered nothing. We'll just skip through that. Um, because of this, because M um, supply is used at both sites, it means that when I'm, I as the customer, I'm waiting impatiently to see whether the supplier has received my stock. I can actually see at what point in their 
process they are. I can see whether they've allocated stock to my order or actually shipped it off. We get a lot of stories of people just constantly calling up supplying stores, being asking whether their stock is on hand. We hope this kind of helps the warehouses feel a little bit less stressed. So that's one short feature. Um, I think what I will do is just show you, I'll just show you our cold chain functionality and then pass it over. So <clears throat> we know that a lot of you, particularly after the COVID epidemic, but just in general, this idea of making sure that your the stock you have on hand actually stays viable is particularly important. So what we have are sensors that you can place in your fridge um, or cold chain equipment to check how your stock is doing. So here what I have is my sensors, which have been placed in a fridge. And all of my data is in 2023. And from here, you can see how your stock has been doing. And the nice thing is that because this temperature monitoring is connected to your stock, you know what stock has been affected by any temperature breaches, and you have this tracking online. We also have a notification system, so if it does go over top, you can see that. We do also have tracking of the cold chain equipment itself, so you can look through your assets. But I think I want to save time for everyone else. And I'm going to pass it really quickly back to Craig. And we are Two slides. nearly finished. Thanks, Tammy. It's, so uh, hopefully where you end up with is that, excuse me, that we, you find a system that fits what your country needs. And uh, that's our, our end game. We say we're a medicines availability organization. We're not a software uh supply organization so that's where we're trying to hit and uh lastly uh we we what we uh find most countries uh are, are wanting is uh for a start visibility of their stock so uh, a billet and uh more than their stock their transactions uh and ideally one place where you can see everything uh we all agree that DHIS2 shouldn't be the place you see every last bit of uh, stock data. It should have management summaries and M supplies dashboards or your LMAS dashboards should be where you find that detailed data. Secondly, cost savings. Uh, we think you shouldn't be installing software unless there's a, there's a positive cost benefit. Um, we think a well-designed system can save you uh, several multiples of what it costs you uh, through improved procurement and reduced wastage. So actually, it's costing a lot of countries money by not installing a good system or not running a, running a system well. And lastly, uh, at the end, uh, we're trying to improve healthcare. We want people who need treatment for conditions to turn up at a, at a health centre and be able to get the treatment they need. And uh, I know we all want the same thing. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Right. A big thank you to uh, Craig and Daniel. That was really great. We have examples of uh, use cases of integration on our website and from previous conferences. So in Laos, I think was the most recent where we have some triangulation dashboards with stock and health data. But uh, thank you very much for that. I see my friend Blessings Kamanga joined us just in time. <laughs> and <laughs> I will throw you in the fire. You're number two uh, up to present. So uh, please welcome up and to share with us the experiences with the cold chain equipment management that you've uh, piloted now in over 100 sites in Malawi. Welcome, blessings. Can you speak so I can hear? Uh, hello. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, Malawi, uh, the warm heart of Africa. And I'm uh, Blessings Kamanga, and uh, I'll be uh, uh, presenting regarding uh, the work that we have done uh, on cold chain uh, equipment. So uh, that's the uh, outline. So uh, just to give uh, a context, uh, all along uh, the management of the cold chain equipment uh, has been uh, through paper-based as well as uh, some uh, Excel files. So initially, just uh, standalone Excel files, and then later on, there was some improvement uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we moved to uh, Google Sheets. Uh, but then uh, it was very challenging in terms of uh, knowing, for example, if you want to know uh, uh, the stock levels uh, of the equipment, uh, as well as maybe the operational status, it was uh, very difficult because it means you do have to uh, make sure that you consolidate those uh, individual files and also uh, making sure that uh, you are able to do uh, the uh, the analysis by your own uh, in the in the Excel. So uh, that alone uh, was uh, a gap in as far as uh, the management of code chain equipment is concerned. So uh, drawing on from the uh, experience uh, that I was uh, I gathered during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, DHS2 tracker was uh, proposed that it should be used to uh, track the uh, code chain equipment. So uh, with that in mind, uh, there was a design which was made. Uh, so the design I uh, was looking at uh, registering the equipment. So looking at uh, what type of equipment it is, uh, the model numbers, uh, as well as uh, some other uh, associated uh, parameters. And the, upon register, registering the equipment, uh, there were three. Uh, there are three stages. Uh, so first one uh, is transactions. So for this one, we're looking at. Uh, if you have registered the equipment, you may need to dispatch it uh, to some other facility. Or you may need to carry out uh, planned preventive maintenance as well as uh, corrective uh, maintenance. So all those uh, were uh, are gathered into a single stage. And then apart from that, uh, there's also a need to make sure that the operational status of that equipment uh, is uh, updated from time to time, such that uh, if the equipment is 40, uh, it has to uh, uh, be noted uh, there and then that the equipment uh, is 40. And then the other part, uh, it's in terms of temperature monitoring. So uh, we need to know uh, to say this equipment, uh, has it triggered an alarm to say uh, the temperature has gone beyond the threshold or uh, it has not? If it has, uh, then uh, some uh, action has to be uh, taken. So uh, all those uh, items are not uh, just happening, but uh, they have to make sure that uh, they provide information that can be uh, used by, for example, uh, code chain technicians, uh, EPI officers uh, to make sure that they come up with necessary interventions. So there's also a component of uh, notifications uh, to notify uh, all those uh, key people uh, in terms of uh, what uh, is uh, is happening. So uh, that's where we also get to uh, the analytics part uh, where you should be able to have a dashboard and then uh, show which uh, equipment are available at a particular time, uh, which ones are requiring uh, maintenance uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we developed, based on the design that I shared, uh, we developed a tracker uh, program. And then uh, after developing that uh, tracker program, uh, we had an orientation for the code chain uh, technicians. So these uh, were from uh, two districts that we uh, wanted to pilot. So that's in Chisi and uh, and Lilongwe. And then uh, after the orientations, uh, we printed out uh, the code, uh, the, bar, uh, the QR codes. So as you can see, uh, we have a QR code there, and then uh, it has a unique identifier. So uh, after printing out the QR codes, uh, the code chain technicians in the two districts went around all the facilities, uh, as well as uh, all the head posts, pasting the QR codes uh, uh, on each and every equipment. So after pasting, uh, it was being uh, scanned. And then after scanning, uh, the other uh, details were being populated in the system. And then uh, the rest of the details uh, were being captured. And then that equipment was being uh, uh, registered. So uh, after registration, uh, there was also a supportive supervision to make sure that if a, 
uh, there are issues we're able to uh, provide uh, uh, support uh, as well as the uh, resolving uh, those issues. So uh, the pilot itself was done uh, in three weeks in those two districts and the, uh, within those three weeks, uh, quality and equipment from 105 facilities uh, were all registered uh, into, the, uh, into the system. Uh, and then uh, in total, uh, we had uh, over 200 equipment uh, registered uh, within, uh, within that period. And then uh, post period, so after one week uh, of the uh, pilot, uh, other districts uh, followed suit. So they followed suit in the sense that uh, there are regional quality and technicians. So because the orientations just involved the two districts, but it also involved the uh, regional quality and technicians. So it's, uh, there are these regional quality and technicians that went now uh, in uh, those other uh, uh, 18 more districts uh, to register some equipment. So uh, within four weeks, we were in 20 districts, uh, of course, uh, with uh, 100 more uh, equipment. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, what happened uh, a week after the, uh, the pilot. Now looking at uh, uh, the challenges, so we had some challenges. So number one was in terms of uh, data quality issues. So on that one, uh, because the, not everyone who was uh, involved in the orientations had given a tablet. So there were some which were using uh, their own uh, uh, personal gadgets. And because they were using uh, their, own, their own personal gadgets, uh, it's kind of difficult to control what happens with that gadget. So you make some changes to the program, you tell them uh, they should sync to have those configurations, they don't sync, and you find out that uh, maybe uh, they are failing to sync because they, they don't have the latest changes that have happened on the server, and then maybe it was complaining to say, so this, for example, some data items were made mandatory, well, for them, uh, they did not sync that, so pushing back the data to the server uh, without uh, syncing the changes, uh, it was bringing issues. So we had at some point in time to remove the logic just to make sure that uh, they, are, they are also able to, watch, uh, to uh, send over uh, what data they had, uh, they had uh, collected. And then uh, on the uh, same, we also uh, had some connectivity challenges. So because the, uh, in these facilities, there are some quality chain equipment uh, located at in, in heavy posts where connectivity is a challenge. So uh, we used much uh, the uh, DHS to data capture app to make sure that the data is uh, are collected in those uh, health posts. So still more, it means we couldn't have real-time data because it was dependent on uh, someone traveling to an area where there's uh, connectivity to make sure that that data is, uh, is uh, uploaded. So those were some of the uh, challenges that we, uh, we faced. And then uh, moving forward, uh, we are looking at uh, carrying out further orientations for the, those other districts uh, so that uh, we should make sure that all the uh, code chain equipment uh, are registered. And then uh, these code chain equipment, they are equipped with uh, device, remote temperature monitoring devices uh, provided by uh, Nextleaf. So because those remote temperature monitoring devices uh, submits the uh, temperature uh, data, so the idea is to make sure that we integrate uh, that with uh, the system that we have come up with such that the, it should be automated. So that stage I was showing about uh, uh, temperature monitoring uh, be uh, automated such that we'll, we'll just be having uh, the uh, values uh, populated to, uh, to that stage. And then uh, the other thing, uh, because to uh, post the data, uh, we needed to provide some data bundles but that becomes posted because the, you may not know what uh, people use uh, that data bundle for. So the idea is to put uh, that uh, system on the reverse billing such like that uh, people should just use it and then the payment can be done centrally, but it also be made uh, based on the usage. So it's a bit uh, cost effective uh, uh, that way. And then uh, the other thing is to uh, continue uh, providing uh, supportive supervision as well as the uh, monitoring uh, the usage of uh, the uh, the code chain uh, the code chain equipment and then uh, in the wrong line uh, we are looking at uh, much as we have covered the code chain equipment but there are also some other equipment uh, within the health sector so we are looking at expanding it uh, to have some sort of a physical asset uh, management uh, management system 
Okay, now uh, that's uh, a sample uh, a dashboard. Uh, okay. Oh, I should go live. Ah, okay. Yeah. So uh, for the dashboard here, uh, we have several items. So for example, uh, the first item, we are looking at uh, functionality of uh, the equipment uh, within the district. So for each district, we're able to see uh, how many equipment are functional, how many are requiring uh, maintenance, and uh, how many are not uh, functional. So with that, it means you can easily act to say, okay, at such, such a district, uh, we have uh, uh, these equipment which need uh, 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 attention. And then uh, apart from that, uh, we also have uh, the one to the far right. We are looking at uh, what sort of uh, equipment uh, do we have? So, uh, for example, there uh, is showing that most of the equipment, uh, the uh, AC vaccine uh, refrigerators, ice line, and then we also have uh, the other distribution. So we're able to see. So, for example, uh, if we want to, uh, if there's need to procure some equipment, uh, like for maintenance and the like, we do know what sort of uh, equipment uh, to uh, to procure. And then, uh, apart from that, uh, we are also looking at the manufacturers. So down there, uh, we have some graph also showing the uh, top brands. So we have uh, vest frost and then uh, so on and so forth. And then the last one, uh, we are looking at uh, what sort of funding uh, was used to procure that equipment. So we also have there uh, uh, Gavi, UNICEF, uh, and so on and so forth. So with that, it means we're also able to show transparency and accountability in terms of uh, the equipment uh, that uh, uh, the development partners as well as the donors uh, provide to uh, to the country. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Blessings, Kamanga. Um, one thing just that I want to highlight, this was done with entirely native DHIS2 features. Uh, so this is not any custom app, custom development. We weren't expecting even to have this as part of the conference, but Blessings messaged me some weeks back and I jumped out of my chair and said, really, you got this far? And then he told me about the districts just taking it on without being part of the pilot. So great work, Blessings, and we look forward to uh, the continuation. Moving on to now Kim from iPlus Solutions and the Medexis ELMIS, who will share about the Mali uh, update on the Mali integration and use case. Welcome, Kim. Hello? Yeah, great. Morning, everyone. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is Kim van der Weide. I'm managing our ELMIS system for iPlus Solutions. And Medexis is active at the moment in four countries. And I'm here on behalf of our Mali team, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, to share you about our use case, uh, where we're integrating with DHIS2. Okay, great. Uh, it's the next one. Oh, okay, okay, great. Uh, that one. Not this one, no. Yeah, okay, perfect. So our project is part of a greater project that's funded by USAID that we're carrying out with the Ministry of Health and Public Hygiene and with Palladium. And we're in three regions in Mali, uh, Segu, Sikasso, and Mopti, and we're covering a population of about 11 million people. So quite a big project. And our objective for our specific activity is to improve the timeliness, completeness, and accuracy of health data. doesn't like me very much. <laughs> I can advance this one or this one? Uh, well, both of them should be coordinated. I thought. No. Ah, that's okay. All right. So we are, thanks. <laughs> we're working, our implementation started in December 2022. So just over a year ago, and we're running until April 2025. And we're targeting 26 health districts and 710 health facilities, of which we are currently in 21 of the 26, just waiting to expand to those last five. And we're only working with free donor products right now in Mali. Um, so not the, they also are working with um, 
products that they sell at the at the health facility. Um, but at the moment, just focusing on the on the free ones. <laughs> Which slide do you this one, yeah. Really not wanting to show this to her as today, but uh, so this is the uh, this was the health supply chain when we started our project. So you, we were working with, or Mali was working with a parallel system, which I think a lot of you can relate to. Uh, so the health facilities, which are referred to as CSCOMs, they're actually association-owned health facilities. They were reporting on DHIS2, their stock and consumption data. This was being displayed in the system OSP Santé um, for the MOH and donors to visualize the data. Uh, but then they were doing their product ordering on a paper-based system, uh, which they were then sending to the district dispatching depots, which I'll refer to as DRCs, and then they were getting the monthly shipment. <laughs> Okay, so when we came in, we were facing quite a few challenges. Uh, number one, it was a very time heavy reporting process. So not only the reporting, but the most specifically the requisition process was very time heavy and it was also paper-based. So very prone to errors, um, really required a lot of work from our health workers and health facility staff. And there was also a very long uh, replenishment lead time because of this. Uh, there was also a lack of timely access to data and the OSP Sante dashboard was not connecting to the product issuing procurement and management um, actions and activities. So there was a bit of a disconnect. And then at the um, CSCOMs, there was also a limited interest in providing these free products because they were having a preference for the um, uh, the, the products that they could sell. Um, that's something we also touched on in our project. Thanks. <laughs> um, so what we're doing, so we are really leveraging the DHIS2 system that's already in place and being used in Mali. Um, so we're keeping it as the interface at the community level and as well as the data center. And what Medexis is doing is we're doing the data-based quantification um, of the donated products and then being that interface between the different levels. So we're still... Uh, engaging with the CSCOMs for their validations, but keep in mind CSCOMs are staying on the DHIS2 interface, and then the other work of quantification is done behind the scenes on Medexis. And we're also working with a digitized shipment receipt workflow and proof of delivery, so that's also in, integrated in the Medexis system. And then as well, the DRC, the district level, is able to initiate that order process uh, for the free donor products. So what we're uh, aiming to achieve is, of course, time savings. That's number one, really making the system more efficient and user-friendly, uh, having improved replenishment forecasting and quantification, uh, improved data quality, and then, of course, in the long term, reducing those stockouts um, and encouraging districts to distribute it, the donated products as well as the, as the private uh, products. So you can follow along a bit with the numbers as I explain a bit how this uh, this works. So the CSCOMs, the health facilities, are entering their data in DHIS2. This stock data is then uh, sent, number one, to OSP Santé. So they're still using this to visualize the data um, for, the, for the MOH and donors. But also the data is then synchronized with Medexis. So at the moment, this is a manual step, but I'll get back to that in a second. Then Medexis uses that data calculating the procurement proposal, which then eventually is sent via DHIS2 back to the health facility for validation. Uh, so now if you're following along, we're now at step four, we then go to step five to approve. If they don't approve and they reject, then they get in touch with the, with the district level and they make any adjustments that are necessary. Um, and then they resend it for validation. The replenishment comes through. And then um, in DHIS2, again, the CSCOMs are validating that they received the products that they were sent. And there's a lot of um, documents being generated by Medexis at this stage. So we've got, uh, of course, the, the procurement proposal, the, the procurement order that's going to the DRC, and as well, the, the packing slip that's coming back. And that's the one that we're monitoring as well, how much product they're getting. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 
So the project is not only working with Medexis, so we're also doing other supply chain building activities. Uh, and that's why the baseline that we started at was already quite high once we got to adding Medexis. Uh, they had already done a lot of strengthening activities. Um, and then we, of course, we started working with Medexis December uh, in December. And you can see at first there's an increase in availability, which is really positive, but then there is uh, a drop off at one point, and this is due to the upstream availability uh, reasons. So there were stockouts across the nation, uh, regions and districts, but that's of course the reality that we're facing in a lot of our projects. And here you can see the uptake. So these are the number of requisitions that are being done, as well as the number of edits uh, by users done to those requisitions. And the number of edits is really good. It shows that there's a lot of engagement between the DRC and the, um, uh, and the health facilities, but it's also showing that which we'll get to in a second is because not the, the data wasn't always uh, entered uh, consistently uh, that some of the quantifications had to be adjusted based on that. Thanks. So if we look at a qualitative review, we did speak to all of the, the district and the health facility users and what two quotes that we, we took out, which we thought were really interesting is that at the DRC district level, they're seeing there's a lot less discussions between the DRC and the health facilities because they know that there's data available, it's reliable. So when they put in the quantification uh, and the procurement order, they know, okay, this is, this is accurate as long as they're entering their data consistently. And at the CSCOM level, it shows that uh, they're able to order on time. They trust the data as well because it's right, right there in front of them um, and coming back to them for validation. So what did we notice? And I'm gonna share with you a lot of key learnings that are definitely not all positive, but I think we've really learned a lot from this first year. So first, the positive is that there was a huge reduction in order requisition time. Uh, and that's what one of our main goals was to make this a more simple process for both the health facilities and the district level. Um, but data reliability is something we're still working on. So we still rely on the CS comes to enter their data on time in DHIS2. Uh, so that's something that we are going to be doing refresher trainings on and really encouraging them. Also, at one point, the synchronization between DHIS2 and Medexis was cut because of a DHIS2 version upgrade. And nobody told us that the synchronization wasn't working So um, <laughs> until a few months later. So we fixed that synchronization. It was really quite easy fix, um, but it showed to us as well, okay, you know, we need to be doing that monthly triangulation to make sure everything is going smoothly. Um, and as well that the synchronization in DHIS2, which is being done by the DRC, is done consistently. And this is something actually we're going to change in the upcoming uh, version, which I'll get to in a second. Um, also, the CSCOMs started reporting how much product they received in their DHIS2 app, uh, which wasn't grayed out, uh, but actually it was Medexis that was already capturing that information from the the the. Um, package slips that were coming through. So it was kind of a bit of a double reporting there in that sense. Uh, and it's limited to monthly data entry. So we're not seeing the real-time data of stockouts live uh, because the DHIS2 app is doing that monthly submission of data. So there's a big opportunity to streamline even more, um, but it does give a proof of concept for a more push model way of doing things um, with, uh, yeah, sorry, with the requisitions. So just to round off, so what are we gonna do next? So we're gonna revise our workflow to make it even more automated. So the synchronization step is gonna be done automatically. Uh, so that's taking out one button push for our DRC level. Um, and also the requisition, the order is also gonna be automated. So that's also gonna be an even stronger push system. Um, and then of course, still including the validation step by the CSCOMs. Refresher training is at the top of our agenda, especially once we adjust this workflow to make sure that the everything is working as necessary. Um, and then we're just gonna continually assess and see how we can improve. But there's lots of opportunities for growth. So we can we would really love to include the market products as well in this um, in this system. That way they're managing the free and the sold products. 
also uh, scaling up once we reach that 26 districts to expand even further. Um, but then the two more innovative opportunities ahead of us are including daily transactional data. So DHIS2, of course, has the has the app where we can if upload data on a stock data on a daily basis. So this is something we would love to look into. And also the digital proof of delivery and scanning um, for matrixes for our donors and better product tracking. I think that's perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for assisting. All right. Thank you to Kim for the presentation, and thank you to Ellen for the support. <laughs> um, to highlight one thing, uh, a great example of close work between the iPlus Solutions team and Dexa CLMIS, and then the implementers of DHIS2 and also the HISP team, HISP WCA and HISP Mali, have been very closely involved, and really that aspect that I mentioned in the beginning of understanding the landscape, defining needs, and then finding the right solution. All right, without further ado, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Hersi from Ministry of Health Somalia will then present their existing use case, but also future plans in Somalia. So welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, I'm presenting uh, the DHS2 uh, logistics that has been implemented in Somalia, but also uh, I'm also looking into the way forward and uh, where we're going from, from there. So uh, Minister of Health Somalia has implemented uh, DHS2, but also uh, the, uh, the LMIS as well. Uh, through the uh, DHIS2 with the support of his uh, Tanzania, uh, University of Oslo, and UNICEF uh, as a technical and, and, and funding support. Uh, the process that we have taken to implement this was uh, engagement with, uh, with the relevant stakeholders, uh, our partners and donors, and also uh, Ministry of Health uh, uh, government uh, at different levels. Uh, the logistics management information system is basically mainly covers uh, the, uh, the medical products that are used uh, uh, in the public uh, facilities in Somalia. Uh, and it's part of the, uh, uh, the supply chain management system that has uh, or, or also an important function of the strengthening of the health system in, in the country. The rationale that we have uh, uh, come across to to use uh, the, the or uh, integrate the the DHIS two uh, with the LMIS was the was that uh, when we implemented DHIS two in Somalia, uh, the HMIS was the main focus. So the data that was captured was mainly uh, the morbidity data. Uh, the uh, there was also at that time the resources that we had was very limited and uh, it was not uh, easy to also implement both morbidity data as well as logistics data at the same time uh, and 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 the issues that we have in somalia is that so the the logistics data has a challenge in terms of availability in terms of uh quality as well and those those were the challenges that we had including the uh the lack of comparability when you don't have uh, logistics data as well as uh, morbidity data together, it's going to be difficult to to analyze uh, and and identify uh, the challenges that you have and where you are in your uh, logistics uh, management system. The logistics data that we currently capture in uh, in the in the DHS two in Somalia. Uh, mainly includes uh, summary forms uh, that's captured and, and reported in monthly summary forms, uh, mainly two forms, and it's captured at the national level. And there are uh, around 263 uh, different products that uh, are reported on a monthly basis uh, by the different uh, facilities. Uh, and these uh, are the indicators that are captured uh, within these uh, monthly reporting uh, tools. Um, when it comes to the product categories, it captures and, and, and encompasses uh, almost all the programs that we have in the country, uh, including essential medicines, uh, ART supplies, malaria, uh, TB, 
nutrition supplies, immunization, family planning, and others. So these uh, this shows actually how uh, our current logistics management information system using DHS2 is already capturing, uh, you know, good amount of of information for the uh, for the country. But where are we going now uh, from the uh, using the DHS2 in Somalia and. Uh, we have uh, uh, a plan to move to a full-fledged uh, ELMIS system. And when we say full-fledged, it's a system that actually captures uh, and responds to all the requirements in, in, the, in, the, in the logistics management information system. And uh, what we're looking for actually is a system that is, in, that is integrated with the, with the DHIS2 because we already have DHIS2 implemented in Somalia since 2016. Uh, we need a system that addresses uh, existing gaps that we have in the programs, in the commodities, in the warehouses. Uh, the current logistics uh, data that is reported does not include the warehouses, does not include coal chains. It only is only limited to the health facilities. So the coal chain information, logistics information, the warehouses, which are currently not captured, we need also that to be included in the in the in the, in the new system that we're going uh, to move to. Uh, we need to make sure that the system that we are going to capture is transactional data. It uh, shows real time information. Uh, it uh, does not capture part of the uh, country or part of the commodities, but actually it shows uh, end to end visibility. Uh, and also, uh, one of the challenges that we have in common uh, in many countries is uh, aid diversion, and that is actually uh, a system that actually provides a solution to that uh, problem. The deployment approach that we have is uh, one ELMI system, and that means actually uh, maybe in different pro in, 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 in some countries, maybe there might, there might be different systems that are responding to the uh, uh, ELMIs, but in Somalia, what we are looking to is one system that captures all programs uh, and all commodities. So that uh, that means actually we are not looking into different systems. Uh, an integrated system, uh, a system that is compliant with uh, uh, target uh, software standards, which has already identified the key features for uh, an ELMI system. Uh, an inclusive uh, consultation also is, is our part of the approach. We have uh, recently, uh, you know, updated our you know TORs uh, for the PSM TWG in Somalia to include uh, strengthening the ELMIS and and, and and the key components and also the deployment of ELMIS in Somalia. And uh, a TOR has already been endorsed for the uh, for the new ELMIS that we are going to implement. Uh, a, a committee has been established. A subcommittee is already in place that is focusing on the on the ELMIS uh, deployment, uh, which comes from the from the PSM TWG, uh, and a quick assessment is going to be also conducted as part of the ELMIS uh, deployment to understand uh, the key gaps and, and and the challenges that we have on the ground. In terms of the uh, timeline, uh, we're looking into uh, two phases uh, when it comes to the timeline. Uh, first six months, we're going to call it uh, as a as a pilot phase, and in those uh, six months, we're going to uh, uh, deploy the system to a limited number of facilities. So first of all, we, we're going to look into the national level. So we go we we covering the whole country, and uh, that means it doesn't it doesn't mean that we're covering all facilities, but we are reaching we are reaching all the states uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, we have seven states in Somalia and we're covering all of them. Uh, we have 18 regions in Somalia and we're covering all the all these 18 regions. But when it comes to the regions, we will select uh, certain districts. We're only selecting seven districts. And these seven districts are where the capital status of these uh, capital, capital cities of the of each state to make sure that uh, we, uh, we don't have a challenge related to connectivity, related to uh, safety and, and those kind of things and uh, easy implementation and accessibility. We are also covering with uh, 18, 14 warehouses and 11 coal genes, 14 hospitals and 35 health centers, 18 PHUs and 21 uh, community uh, health workers. This information will be captured in the and, and integrated into the ELMIS, the new LMI system, in the first six months. That's going to be our our pilot phase. 
Uh, and after the pilot phase, we're looking into expanding and, and deploying the system uh, on a full scale. And that uh, is expected to take around two years. That means actually the remaining facilities and, and, and regions and states will be reached uh, in, the, in, the, in, in those two years. Also, as part of our approach, we are going to have a TOT training or super user training, whatever we call them. And uh, those are, around, are going to be around 30 people uh, to be the core team that uh, will be uh, doing the further you know, uh, cascading of the systems. Uh, and also each and every facility that uh, receives uh, or integrates in, is integrated into the system, we're going to provide uh, equipment. Uh, and these equipment uh, could be laptops or they could be uh, uh, personal computers. We're also in, uh, ensuring that uh, each and every facility has a internet con or connectivity. And as part of the uh, process goes on, we're going to do a continuous monitoring of the uh, process and also an evaluation at each uh, interval uh, uh, steps. For example, maybe the first six months when we finish the pilot phase, we're going to conduct a full evaluation of the process and how it has been done so far. Uh, as part of the our selection process and how we're going to approach, we're going to make sure that we also include a benchmarking visit uh we are not only maybe going for uh uh vendors that are only you know uh, providing support to other countries but making sure that uh, uh our team goes into the uh into the countries that have been implemented in these systems and ensure that uh the system is how the systems are working how the systems have been uh, responding to to the needs of the countries that have been uh, deployed to so that we understand the challenges, we understand uh, the good things and also uh, the, 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 the pros and cons of each uh, of the systems. We are uh, part of our process also to update uh, the, the, uh, the essential medicines list, the STGs, standard med med treatment guidelines of the country, uh, and the full uh, scale uh, period, we are going to look into uh, uh, a Minister of Health-led process. So we need to build the capacity of the team within the first six months and ensure that we have a core team, uh, a super user user's super user team that can take over the, uh, the, the the cascading of the of the you know uh, the, uh, of the uh, second phase of the of the of the deployment of the system. As part of our process in this, uh, what is going, what is also this going uh, deployment system is also going to help us is to transition uh, of the supplies from the partners to the government. This means actually in Somalia there are you know uh, many partners that are storing and keeping uh, medicines in in warehouses that they manage, and part of this process is actually is also a reform that is going that that will make sure that uh, those uh, facilities and warehouses and call units that are going to be integrated into the system are the government uh, uh, institutions and systems. Uh, the consultations that we are, that we will also make as part of the approach is uh, is, is uh, the Minister of Health uh, and partners and donors to make sure that uh, everybody actually is uh, is on board and everybody is consulted. Uh, also, uh, we have a PSM TWG, as I've already mentioned, and that uh, is already uh, taking a, a strong role in, in, in the implementation of this, uh, of this system. Thank you very much. Uh, that's my last end of Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Hersi. Uh, definitely not lacking in ambition, uh, big projects and big plans ahead. And I think with a lot of experience with DHIS2 to know how to leverage the existing use, existing stock data capture to then model the future plans. So thanks again for sharing. Now, last but not least, uh, the team from Softworks presenting the soft NMIS. So we have Mahmoud Islam and Jean-Pierre Saleh. So welcome to the stage and they'll present their solution. Uh, true problem solvers, we're looking forward to it. This way? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's the opposite. Oh, it's okay. Do I have to press anything or it's fine? No. no that's okay. You can hear him? You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we are from Softworks. My name is Mahmoud Al Islam. I am the managing director and technical lead. Uh, I have here with me Mr. Jean Pierre Saleh. Can you introduce, please? So then I'll start. Yeah, can you introduce so that yeah, we can start? Hi, I'm Jean Pierre Saleh, and I'm the pharmaceutical system advisor uh, with uh, Softworks. So I will start the presentation. I will, uh, and we will do it together. Uh, a few slides for me and a few slides for Mr. Saleh. So, um, I mean, first a little, uh, yeah, about Softworks. We were established in 2007 and uh, we are having a team of 22 now. Our main focus of software development is actually health information system development. So this map gives a brief of where uh, we had worked in last 17 years. Uh, there is a color variation here. Uh, the gray ones are the ones which are, uh, I mean, not inside DHS2. You can say these are our custom LMRs implementations. And the light yellow ones are the ones which are DHS2 integrations or interoperability, you must say. So, and there are, I mean, if you read through, I mean, I'll not, I mean, uh, I mean actually go through all of them. So, uh, I mean, some of the LMISs are, as you all know, I mean, sometimes LMISs are monthly reportings. And sometimes you will see that they are transactional. So mainly, I mean, we, some of the systems that we developed are transactional. As an example, the, you can see here in the screen, the Benin, and uh, the Botswana, the Burkina Faso, these systems, uh, they are transactional, means they, they cover the day-to-day the -day functions of the, um, of the LMI system. And then uh, I also had put an emphasis on 100% DHIS to, on two of the blocks, just to mention that they are integrated inside DHIS2. What I mean is, I mean, it, I mean all the data actually goes inside DHIS2 because of that. So I'll not stay too much here. So, I mean, yeah, this slide gives an understanding of what soft LMIS is. Okay, so in one line, it's a transactional LMIS built on top of DHS2. Four major things that we always mention, uh, I mean, what it can do. So it's a transactional LMIS, as I mentioned, and it has inbuilt feature of first expiry, first out. I mean, do bring the uh, issue invoice phases, it can generate uh, or propose quantities, which is based on like the, the earliest, earliest expiry batch to be proposed to be taken out first. Then it allows you to generate a LMS report on the fly and, in, uh, and, and automated. And as I mentioned, the data uh, is stored finally inside the DHS2. And uh, one special feature is that it allows you to maintain the stock by batch and expiry. On the left side, it gives the, the major functions that uh, I mean, soft telemice can do, uh, like the transactional functions. So you have to first do a stock take as you uh, start using the software, like your initial stock take. And then as you continue receiving from, um, I mean, receiving commodities from the higher level, you have to receive it into the software. Then if you are a district warehouse, then you can issue to the lower levels. You can submit orders inside the software and the system can propose you the order quantities that you may need based on your average use or consumption. Then you can do stock adjustments, for example, expiries or, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the periodic stock counts or anything. And then dispensing to the patients is always there. So why the sync data thing is here, the software can operate offline so that uh, you do not need internet when you are using it on your day-to-day -day functions and you can decide, I mean, when you want to send the data, uh, I mean, when you have internet like that. Um, this slide has two sides, on the left and the right. So the left side explains when we say, okay, data goes to DHIS2, where does it go to DHIS2? That's what we mentioned here. We didn't 
hack anything or created new tables, everything goes into how DHS to stores data itself. So like the, um, yeah, the balance and the lemmas reports, these are periodic things. So they go into the DHS to aggregate. Uh, tracker holds the transactions like the receive, dispense, these we are saying that the, the I mean, the software is managing or um, I mean, tracking invoices, you can say that. Then the batch wise stock, as well as the stock card for every product, they are, uh, I mean, stored inside the DHIS2 events. In this way, we managed uh, to, to save data inside DHIS2 following the principles that they uh, tell us to do, uh, you know, data saving inside DHIS2. On the right side, we mention what are the technologies that we have used to, to develop the things. So the, I mean, we have a uh, front-end app, means a DHIS2 custom app, which is uh, developed using React. And then we also have a companion Android app, which was uh, developed using the React Native, so that we can do uh, you know, reuse of source code. And there's a middle tier, which is uh, using the Node.js, which actually uh, I mean, takes the, the communication between the DHIS2 and uh, the apps. So this one uh, gives more kind of the connections. So you can see at the top, we have the or says that we have two ways of entering data. One is there is a DHIS2 custom app, which uh, we developed, and then you have to install it in your DHIS2 platform. And uh, as you see the database, uh, you know, uh, things the, it saves data in the browsers in DexDB. So the, even the web-based thing can save data offline, uh, even when you are using it in the browser. Alternately, you can opt to go for an Android app, which has the exact same functionality, but it saves data in the local space of the Android app in the SQLite database. As in when you have internet, you can push data through the Node.js service middle tier towards the DHIS2. So data goes and comes back, uh, uh, I mean, to and from DHIS2 using the middle tier itself. Um, we are going to the second phase, but I will, um, um, I mean, yeah, the second section of the presentation where we will share some challenges, uh, what we, learned through the implementations in different countries like that. So I will stop after this slide and Mr. Jean-Pierre will take over. So this one, we want to say, I mean, it was not a uh, easy ride, as I may say, like, it's not like we just designed it. It took us three years to come at this point. And there were some uh, challenges, uh, as we all know that DHS2 was not for LMIs. It, it was actually for the MIS thing. So we had to do some changes or adjustments based on as we move along and things uh, stopped working, we have to, I mean, uh, yeah, find our way around. And I'll not read all of this, I'll just I can say, I mean, one of the examples. So we started with demo, right? I mean, uh, yeah, everyone starts with a demo software. You have 100 products, everything works fine. So when we loaded with the 2,400 products of one country and boom, it stopped, it was killed on that day. So then we found out that you cannot really have this many elements in a report, right? People do want to see a report of all our products. So they had, uh, you know, uh, I mean, more than 1,000 products. Then we found that uh, using elements you can you can add actually 400 to 500 elements in a DHS2 report. You cannot do more than that. I mean, it has a limitation. So then we had to design most of the reports as custom reports using custom queries inside DHS2 as well. So the options are there. The good part is DHS2 has all the options to, to bypass the main thing, and then you can uh, still continue using DHS2 but we have to do some of the adjustments to make sure that the, the software continues working. So I uh, would now hand over to Jean-Pierre Saleh to, to continue the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, so good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, so 
Now I'm just going to show you briefly what. Uh, Maybe I'm not. What, now I'm on the shift. Still. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what the the soft LMIs look like. Uh, I won't go into details, but uh, as you can see, typically it works on a tablet, Android tablet. And on the left, you'll see the menu option, stock status, order, receive, dispense, adjustment, etc. what was explained before. And then on the right, you'll see the data. So in this case, you can see the, the stock status where you can see the, the number, the batch number, the expiry date, and the, the balance and the price. Okay. Uh, now, uh, that's a, we're talking about the one-click uh, monthly LMIS report. So here you are. This is already a uh, program, and it, it's done through the uh, DHIS. Same thing. You can see your opening balance, your received, your dispense, and uh, if any quantity are expired. Um, that's a, 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 a report for, that you can you know, query you where basically you can say, okay, give me all the product that's going to expire within the next 30 days or or 60 days or et cetera. So here again, you'll see the detail by lot expiry date and, and the stock available. Okay. Um, this one is a more like a, a report for the manager to manage uh, uh, the environment if you want. And you can see that it's a timeliness report uh, so the green one means that people submitted the, the report on time, the yellow late, it was submitted late, and red not submitted at all. Uh, so again, it's something which is very good, you know, in terms of creating some form of a competition, if I may say, or emulation within, you know, among the different facility because they know they're being watched. <laughs> and uh, the good news, because it's integrated to the DHIS and it's based on the transaction that actually happened, we don't have to worry about the completeness. I mean, the data is there or is not there, that's the bottom line, so uh, timeliness. Now, that's another uh, sample report is actually your stock card um, for a particular product. So you can see what is the, uh, the, the, the current status of the product uh, in your area, uh, which, whichever you know you choose. Um, and you can see the receipt quantity issue, stock balance, lot number, expiry date, and uh, uh, in some case, you know, there was a stock adjustment, so you can see uh, it's written there, stock take, okay? Um, now, again, you know, this, you cannot really see the detail, but that idea, you can do a lot of visualization uh, through the DHIS using the transaction data, okay? So I won't go into detail there. Uh, so we'd just like to show you some kind of uh, uh, impact based on our experience uh, through the implementation in uh, different countries. As you can see, the reporting rate here, you know, from uh, uh, about, uh, about three years, three, four years, the reporting rate have increased. And I think one of the reasons, is, as I mentioned, is the fact that people are being watched somehow. Uh, however, you, you have to be careful. Based on our experience, you know, you push those people to report, and after a while, you you see it starts to go down again. There's a kind of reporting fatigue, if I may say, but uh, you have to be aware of that. And people are people, right? So anyway, but I must say, most of the time, we, we've been really close to 100%. So that's very encouraging. I think people see the value also. The fact that they can have access to the data, they see value to the system. You know, if there's no value to, for the people, then they won't care too much about it. We, we know that. I mean, you mentioned that... Uh, you know, you, I've been involved in implementing, implementing system in many countries, the same system. And what makes a difference is not the system, because if you implement the same system, it's the people behind the system. So sometimes, an example, when I spend years, I'm not kidding to have a, one system working properly in one place. And I had another example when I went in one site, I put the system just to make sure that it was working on the computer. I say, okay, I'll come back two weeks later to start you know, the implementation. They were already using it. So you know, you, you get this kind of uh, experience. Uh, now, stock out, again, you know, uh, through the system data, uh, you can see also you know, the trends and, and take uh, action. Again, you know, uh, system, I like to say, System uh, or computer don't take any responsibilities. 
<laughs> so the seed time again not going to solve everything, but at least you can see what's happening and and take decision. Uh, this one is a nice one. It's a another form of visualization of your your stock. You can look at a particular product and you can zoom in a particular health area or district or whatever whatever your structure is, and you people that are using the system can define what is their um, um, maximum and minimum stock. So it's color coded. As you can see, uh, stock art is in red and uh, green, it's good, is within the parameter one to two months as defined and overstock is blue. So, and that's something that we find a lot of time in implementation. You can look at a very small area. And you're going to see like in this case, like in red, it's out of stock. However, you can see there's two other facilities that are overstock. And I think, you know, then you can say, okay, well, let's move product from there to there. That's it, as simple as that. And it's much easier than waiting for them to get the next order, et cetera. So that's a very uh, powerful and visualized, easy to do. You don't have to even look at number, it's there. Um, all right, then uh, one of my last slide, <laughs> almost. <laughs> Um, here, you, uh, one thing which is important with our system, there's a, for each transaction, you have a user stamp, a time stamp, and also the value of the, the transaction. So you can, again, you know, took your, take your, uh, the value of your stock, your turnover. You can see also what the value of your sales, which will allow you maybe to, to correlate the data with the other financial system, if any, that will, uh, you know, collect data on revenue and see whether it match. Again, by using that, we've been able to increase the revenue of some facilities. They say, hey, well, we didn't know we sell so much, but now they they watch more and they say, hey, you know, you didn't report all those things. So anyway, uh, so why software matters? That, that's a, <laughs> because we are nice people, obviously, you know, so that's why you should be taking us. But uh, seriously, um, of course, I'm not going to talk about the DHIS and Oslo University, you know where it is. Uh, the system work online, offline, which is important because not everybody has mentioned before, so you know, has a good internet connection. An important approach, we, <clears throat> our approach in implementation is really to strengthen capacity at the local level for make sure that people using the system and can handle the system, the maintenance and extra. And then once we're done, there's no fee, no license fee. So, the hosting of the data, the, the deployment of the system is your business. Uh, I mean, we can help you if you want, but what I'm saying, there's no string attached. Okay, as I mentioned, because it all goes to the DHIS, you can use the DHIS dashboard to create new report, et cetera, custom report. Mentioned about, obviously, triangulation of data with public health, even financial data with logistic data, and interoperability. So we uh, create uh, APIs for you know interoperability with the warehouse system and stuff like that. Uh, one thing I must mention before uh, I show the last slide uh, is um, the, the the system is is not meant for warehouse. Okay, it's anything below that I would say. So I, I want to be clear about that. So and now we'll show you a quick uh, here. Video won't be too long. <laughs> that summarizes all what I said. We monitor real time stock status of the health supply chain tiers. Hmm. Uh, is this downloaded or is it streaming? Uh, is it streaming or downloaded? It's streaming. Wi Fi is going to be attached. So there we go. At least people here can see it, right? It's on YouTube. People working here. I think if if the Wi-Fi can't handle it, then maybe this can be the uh, the next thing the participants click on is watching the videos as they leave. One last try.
if it happens. Okay. Anyway, the good news is that we do have a card that we can give you, and there's a video on it. All right. So if you want it. Wish you could monitor real time stock status of the health supply chain tiers? Okay. The slides are online, so yeah. we can make all that available. So. Big thank you to Software and Soft LMIS. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, to all of the presenters today. A lot of different use cases and approaches to the LMIS challenges that we have out there. Um, I want to hand the floor directly over to you. Any questions to any of the presenters uh, throughout the day? Any, uh, any comments for Softworks team here now? Maybe I, I actually have a question for blessings if I can. Um, you piloted in two districts, 18 other districts just took it on themselves. How, how does that happen? How do they, uh, on their own, start implementing a DHS2 solution without central support, without your support, without your involvement? I'm really curious to know how that happens. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. So uh, one key thing uh, is uh, uh, feedback. So we have some uh, communication channels. So mostly uh, there are these WhatsApp groups where uh, people do communicate. So the other districts where are seeing the positive stories from uh, their colleagues and they, uh, much as they did not get the formal training, but they were curious uh, to have it done. So that's why they requested uh, the regional college and technicians uh, to go through and give uh, some just short mentorship so that they can, uh, they can carry on. Yeah, so it's about uh, that feedback as well as uh, uh, coordination at, at national level. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. One question in the back here. Oh, two questions. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Abdurrahman. Just a quick question on the cold chain tracking, eh? does it only have uh, the cold chain equipment and related or also the vaccine? Are you also tracking the vaccine at the cold chain facilities? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. So uh, this one is just sorry for cold chain tracking. For tracking the vaccines, there is a separate uh, system that we're using. So we're using uh, open LMIS. Yeah, thank you. All right, and then Monica in the back, one moment. Good exercise to run around with the microphone. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, my question is to the Medexas team. Yes, I'm really interested in how you convinced the National Warehouse for uh, to allow visibility of of their stock and that end to end connection without you know politics and issues. How did you manage that? Because I think it's a real issue in some countries. Hi, so we're actually not yet working at the national warehouse, so it's only reaching up to the district level. Yeah, and they're, they're uh, quite open about working uh, working together, but not yet the national, but hopefully in the future. So, so no politics? No it's politics fun. yet. <laughs> Amazing. Any other comments or? Uh, no. Thank you. Thank you to all the presenters once again, and uh, feel free to reach out to them in the hallways and... Uh, Thanks, Ellen, for all the support. Thank you very much.